Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ray. I'm the CEO of uh, Innova Lab. Today we have here a very special guest, Dr. Jerome Keen, Managing Director of the International Vaccine Institute. But before going to him, just uh, telling you how this works. You have a button in the bottom uh, called Q&A. That's where you ask your questions. Please uh, let us know who you are, if you're a high school student or undergrad. And if you want to ask a question by text, video, or audio. Second, uh, for the people that do not speak English, uh, there is a translation button at the bottom of the screen. So if you want to hear in English, uh, choose English. Se você quer escutar em português, use o botão português. Ok? So I will introduce you the hosts of uh, today. Uh, they are Breno and Enzo. So can you please introduce yourselves? Well, hello everyone. My name is Breno. I'm 16, a sophomore in high school. I'm interested in medicine and engineering, but I still haven't decided which way I'm going. But I'm very interested in this whole vaccine and genome thing. So it's a pleasure to be here talking with you, Dr. Kim. And well, I guess that concludes it all. I'm focused on becoming someone that one day will make the difference on the future without losing the character and being humble. Well, that's it. Good to meet you. Yeah, Enzo? Hello, Dr. Kim. Very nice to have you on. My name is Enzo. I'm an undergraduate student, a uh, software <laughs> student of agriculture engineering at University of Sao Paulo. Bless you. Um, I'm very thrilled to have you in. I'm interested in various areas of which uh, certainly biotech include, uh, is, in, is in the top of the list. Um, so as a, as to start off, I uh, would like to know, we know you're the managing director of the International Vaccine Institute. I uh, would, like, uh, would like you to, uh, you to give us a little bit of a background and the main works you've been doing. What is the Institute all about? Please, if you could. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the International Vaccine Institute is the only international organization that um, is involved in the discovery, development, and delivery of vaccines for global health. And we were founded actually initially by the United Nations Development Program, although we're not United Nations, um, we're not a part of the United Nations. Um, but the thinking in 1997 was that, you know, the world needed a place where vaccines that are primarily directed at infectious diseases found in developing countries um, could be developed. Because we know that the, the big companies, the GlaxoSmithKline, Merck, Pfizer, they have programs that are focused on uh, infectious diseases that are found in advanced, in high income countries. Um, but it wasn't really clear who was going to develop vaccines, for instance, for cholera or for typhoid, because those are not diseases typically found um, in, in the upper middle income and, and high income countries. And, and as a result, there was a gap. And um, so IVI was designed initially to fill that gap. And, and as a result of funding from Korea, Sweden, uh, and India, uh, and the Gates Foundation, we were able to develop a vaccine against cholera, which is now, whenever you hear about a cholera outbreak, whether it's in Haiti or uh, Yemen or South Sudan, it's IBI's oral cholera vaccine made not by us, but by companies around the world to whom we've transferred the technology. Um, and 40 million doses have been used so far. And, um, and actually the demand for that vaccine exceeds this, the current supply. So new manufacturers are potentially coming online um, shortly. We're working on other vaccines for global health, typhoid conjugate vaccine, um, which can be given to infants uh, to protect them against typhoid, uh, and a few others that are that are earlier in in development. And again, all this work is funded by charitable foundations and by um, and by governments, Korea, Sweden, India, and actually now we just learned Finland. Um, Brazil is a signatory uh, to IVI's treaty, um, and you know we're very excited to the possibility of you know working in Brazil. Um, Although we haven't, uh, we don't have anything ongoing. Oh, actually, we do have a collaboration with Butantan um, to help develop a dengue vaccine. So, um, but so that's IVI in a nutshell. We are working in, in COVID nineteen um, primarily. 
uh, with an American company uh, testing a vaccine in Korea, and then with Korean companies that are trying to develop a vaccine to help them uh, through the process of development. So again, one of the things we do is we try to be an accelerator of technology. So if there are companies working on a vaccine and they need uh, assistance from us, then we try to help if we can. Very nice. Uh, and just uh, relating to that, as we were talking before we came live, uh, maybe uh, sp sp uh, in, in South Korea and, and specifically in, in the area of Seoul, you guys may be experiencing a second wave, right? Uh, South, South Korea has been famous for uh, well handling the pandemic, uh, arguably better than any other country. Um, do you see any, um, I, mean, I mean, of course, these things are very difficult to foresee, but how do, how, how do you think this possible second wave is going to, is going to unfold? So I think that the government will use the same approach that it used uh, during the first wave. Um, they, they haven't gotten rid of the committee. So South Korea's response to pandemic threats uh, is based on a law um, that was passed um, in actually decades ago, but was revised in 2010, then revised again in 2016 and 17 after a big another coronavirus outbreak, outbreak this one caused by the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And they took advantage of the fact that they made a lot of mistakes um, during that MERS outbreak. And they changed the law in order to, to improve their ability to do the testing, tracking, isolating, and treating, which is the, the core of the South Korean um, approach. And so, you know, as the number of cases uh, drew down, and actually, you know, we were for over a month under 50 new cases a day, and then for the last three weeks under 10 cases a day, and actually last week, for three days, we were, un we were under five cases uh, and or no cases, especially of local trans locally transmitted. There are a number of Koreans who'd come back from Europe or the United States um, who were still in isolation who tested positive, but local transmission um, went down to almost zero. And I think, you know, when people were asking us about it, we said, look, you have, it doesn't matter. No one's gonna ever stop at this point. As long as there's COVID anywhere, COVID can come back. And you re the government really just needs to be ready for the next outbreak. And so and I, the next outbreak occurred. Um, I think people became a little more comfortable with the idea that, you know, it was under relative control. And, you know, there was an exposure, actually 1,500 to 2,000 exposures in nightclubs uh, around Seoul, um, a single person uh, who was infected um, and had visited all these venues, and, and now the government is in the process of doing what it did before, you know, testing, tracking, or tracing, and um, treating, and then isolating those people who were exposed um, to keep them from infecting others. And, and that's actually really important. So, and I'll just illustrate that. There was an example of, um, in the original outbreak of an outbreak in a call center. So you can imagine these call centers. There are 100 people in a tiny room answering phones. And the person who was infected uh, infected 79 people in this room or 70 something people in this room of almost 100 people, one person. But they managed to, to identify all of those infected people and isolate them and isolate the family members who might have been exposed to them. They also went into to the adjoining rooms and found almost no transmission, which was good. And they went to the floor above and the floor below and they tested everyone in the entire building. And they found only a couple of exposures in the elevator, um, but no other transmissions. So, so it made them feel comfortable that they managed to contain it. And, but you know, you can imagine if all you did was diagnose and isolate the original person, you would have had 97 people additionally positive who were out um, infecting others in the community, not really knowing uh, that they were infected. So this process of testing and tracing and then isolating the people who were um, potentially exposed and definitely those who were infected um, really has a, a tremendous advantage in terms of containing epidemics. Well, Dr. Kim, uh, one question that many people ask is how does the coronavirus differs from other viruses and flus like the Hispanic flu, H1I1, or any other kind of virus, and what's making it so hard to keep track of and to fight against the virus? So uh, that's a great question. Um, and you know, my my work when I was younger was was primarily on HIV, 
And the, the, diff the big difference here is that HIV is not transmitted in droplets through the air. HIV is transmitted um, sexually. Um, cor this coronavirus, in, in a way, is like the flu in that it's transmitted by droplets, uh, you know, by people coughing and talking, et cetera. Um, all viruses are, are slightly different. Um, the coronaviruses, actually, the minor coronaviruses cause a syndrome very close to you know, the common cold. There have been a number of coronaviruses recently that have been a big problem. And a coronavirus is just an, an, um, a virus made of RNA. Um, and it's grouped into families. And the beta coronaviruses um, have been particularly problematic for us. Um, the SARS outbreak, the first SARS outbreak, so I'll call that SARS-1 rather than use um, SARS-CoV because it gets confusing. So SARS-1 in 2002 um, was a major outbreak in Asia and it started in China, it spread to Hong Kong, it spread you know, actually all over the world at that point. Um, but the, the difference here is that when you were sick with, when you were transmitting, you were very, very sick. So, you know, you were coughing, you had a fever, you had a, you know, actually a very severe illness that had a mortality rate of 10%. So pretty severe infection. But when you were sick, you were transmitting. There wasn't um, in a period where you were asymptomatic where you had no symptoms, but you were transmitting. So that's a big difference compared to the current one. The second coronavirus was the one uh, that's called, that causes Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And it came to us um, through, from bats, through camels, to humans. And it really, it infects, so it goes from camel to human, and that initial infection isn't efficiently transmitted to people, um, to other people. So people will infect their family members, or if they go to the hospital, and the hospital is not following good infection control procedures, it can spread to the nurses and technicians and doctors in the hospital. But we've gotten much better at it. So all you, you know, you, you use good infection control practices and it doesn't spread in the hospital um, because it really isn't efficiently spread from person to person. The problem with this virus is, as opposed to SARS-1, this current SARS virus um, spreads efficiently from asymptomatic people. So you could be walking around, 80% of people have mild to no symptoms and are walking around. I mean, they might be coughing, but just the act of talking to someone in very close, um, you know, it, someone who's close to you, speaking to them or being involved in a conversation if people are grouped together, um, can be transmitted. So that's a big difference. And then the other part is um, that it's much more infectious than the MERS virus. So it's probably as infectious as, as SARS-1. Um, it may actually be slightly more infectious. It is than the regular flu, you know, the flu that goes around every year. Um, it may be eight to 10 times more infectious than that flu. Um, it's probably as infectious as the Spanish flu was in 1918 to 1919. So the combination of transmission while a person is asymptomatic and um, ease of transmission from person to person makes this one different uh, from the other coronaviruses that we have. It's also, you know, uh, 10 times more deadly than the flu, than the standard flu. So again, you know, we're looking at something that really has caused tremendous morbidity, sickness, and mortality or death around the world. And one of the things people don't realize is there's a, the numbers 80%, 14%, 5%, and 2%. 80% of people have mild, uh, no symptoms or mild symptoms. 14% of people actually need to go to the hospital. 5% require ventilation, are really, really sick, and 2% die. Those 14%, so if you took 14% of Brazil's population and you had to put them in a hospital, would you have enough hospital beds? And the answer is no, no one has that many hospital beds. So the goal is to keep people out of the hospital as long as possible. When they need treatment, and this is what South Korea does, you are taken to a center that can monitor you. Because one of the things I think we found in the United States and in Italy is that people who are just told, you know, you're sick, stay at home, don't realize how sick they're getting. So that the amount of oxygen in people's blood actually gets to dangerously low levels. And because they're sitting around at home and they don't really feel symptoms. I mean, usually if you were getting um, the amount of oxygen in your blood drops, you get very short of breath and you're you know, gasping for air. It doesn't happen in, in this case until people get very advanced and the pneumonia has, very, you know, this infection in the lungs has taken over a significant portion of the lungs. And so when they get to the hospital, they are so sick 
know, they need to be in, uh, intensively monitored or they need to be on a ventilator. And, and that is just, that's unusual, especially in young people. And it's been seen um, frequently in the United States and, and also in Europe. So it's a very different disease um, and one that I think we're still learning from. All right, Dr. Kim, we have a question from Luisa Coutinho from Belo Horizonte. Uh, she's asking if, given that the, the similarities between SARS-1 and SARS-2, can we use some of the data from the vaccine of SARS-1 to sort of have a jump start to the vaccine of SARS-2? And if, 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 if yes or no, how, how long would you, uh, would you extrapolate, would you think that a, 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 an effective vaccine for uh, SARS-2 would be available uh, to, to, to the general public? Well, that is a great question. Um, so you'd think that having had a almost 20 year head start, uh, with SARS-1 that we would have, a, um, it would be easier to develop a vaccine for SARS-2. But in fact, um, and, and this has been one of the problems with outbreaks like uh, SARS. Um, we start, the, the outbreak starts, there's lots of publicity, people are hospitalized, you know, um, you know the public gets understandably nervous. Uh, governments start to put funding into developing a vaccine. And then like SARS-1, it disappears. And the funding goes away. And so companies and universities that started to work on the SARS-1 vaccine um, don't actually get far enough uh, along in the process for the vaccine to actually be proven to protect against SARS-1. With SARS-1, there was an additional problem, which is when they started testing the vaccine, initially, you know, you like in our lab at IBI, we'll create a vaccine in the laboratory and we'll test it to see, you know, if it develops the right protective responses called immune responses and whether it protects against infection in a mouse uh, or a hamster or a rabbit. Um, we call them small animals, uh, small animal models to distinguish them from the monkey models. Um, and we test them. And when they tested the initial versions of the SARS-1 vaccine, they actually saw a problem that the vaccines appeared to protect against SARS-1, which was great. But they, there was an issue in some of the animals and some of the mice in particular um, that they would actually develop a second form of pneumonia that people were worried was coming from the vaccine, from the SARS-1 vaccine. And you know, they did experiments then in, um, in ferrets, which are like weasels, uh, in hamsters and in monkeys. And sometimes they saw it and sometimes they didn't. And they used different vaccines. And again, some vaccines seem more likely to cause it than others. And really after about 2010, most of the work on SARS-1 stopped because SARS-1 disappeared. The, the markets that sold the animals that transmitted SARS-1 to humans were, were closed. And as a result, we haven't seen SARS-1 again. There have been a couple of vaccines from, for SARS-1, and, and people have wondered, will they cross-protect? Because SARS-1 and SARS-2 are about 80% similar. Um, so there is some suggestion that SARS-1 vaccines will protect against SARS-2, but because of the, the, the other problem, the problem that um, we call it enhanced pulmonary disease occurred in some of the animal models. Um, people are, are a little reluctant to test the SARS-1 vaccines, although you know, some of them are, are ready and could be tested, but, but it's been difficult for them to find funding uh, for those vaccines. However, the SARS-1 vac SARS-2 vaccines have been moving along very quickly. In fact, um, there are a thousand, thousands of people now um, enrolled in SARS-2 vaccine trials uh, around the world. And um, you know, it may be that in six to 18 months, we could have um, a vaccine that works if everything goes right. Um, and so just as a segue to what you just uh, explained to us, Dr. Kim, uh, because I, thought, I think you brought up the great dilemma about the vaccine, right? Because we have, um, how long is it gonna take and how safe is it gonna be, right? Because it has uh, to come as quickly as possible, but it also has to be safe. So where do you at the IVI try to find the balance between getting it out as quickly as possible, but it also being as safe as possible? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so to back up a little bit, um, when, you're, when you're thinking about a vaccine, um, you, you do this initial series of experiments in animals because again you know you don't want to subject healthy human beings i mean remember vaccines are given to healthy humans to keep them healthy so there's a different level of um of, of attention to safety for vaccines than for medicines 
because you know if you're sick and you're dying of, of COVID two or sorry of COVID nineteen, the you know you want to have something that works, and so you're you're trying um, the malaria medicine hydroxychloroquine or remdesivir or you know some of the other agents that are being tested um, because people are very sick and they're on ventilators and we really want to get them you know make them better. With a vaccine, you give it to everybody. I mean, to children, to elder, to the elderly, to you know, teenagers, everyone in the population, and they are healthy. And the last thing you want is for the vaccine to make them sick. So we test them in animals first, first in the in mice um, usually, and then move them forward in, in progressively larger and more complex animals until we test them in monkeys. So the data right now uh, for COVID nineteen are that there have been at least three groups that have tested them in monkeys. Two of them have been reported. And in both those circumstances, they saw protection against disease, but no evidence of this enhanced pulmonary disease. So it could be that SARS-1 and SARS-2 are different, or it could be that the preparations of vaccine that were done you know, for SARS-1 were all done in the laboratory rather than in a manufacturing facility. Uh, we don't really know, um, but I think you know, we will continue to pay attention to safety and how will that be. Um, so when you take a vaccine into humans, you, um, you have to pass scientific and ethical review. So you have to present the protocol to, to an ethical committee. And often there's a scientific review associated with that committee. And you have to present it to what we call a national regulatory authority. In the United States, it's the Food and Drug Administration. In Europe, it's an organization called um, uh, the EMA. Um, but they review the protocol, they review the safety information that you have, you know, all the animal data that you, that you have are all presented to them actually in a very long document that they review. And if they let you go forward, then they're convinced that there should be no problem uh, in the initial tests in humans. When you start those tests, you set up some, something called an independent data and safety monitoring board. So this is a group aside from the investigators. So right, you have the professor doing the study in the university laboratory um, or in the university clinic, but you also have, <clears throat> and you have the company which collects all the safety information, but also you have this independent group which is advising the company or the institute that it's safe to proceed. We're looking at all the things that are happening. You know, uh, a person reports that their arm is sore after the vaccination. Or a person reports that they have uh, a rash uh, around the site of the vaccination or that it's itchy uh, or that they feel tired after the vaccination. And so all of those things are being recorded and reported back uh, both to the organization like IBI or to, a, to the end to the data and safety monitoring board. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, the data and safety monitoring board actually continues to monitor you as you move from the first phase of testing into the second phase and into the third phase. And it's often the data and safety monitoring board that is looking to make sure that the vaccine is causing absolutely no problems. So it doesn't matter if we're doing it over five to 10 years, which is the usual, or over six to 18 months, that data and safety monitoring board is chartered to make sure and to provide independent input on uh, the safety of the vaccine, safety and efficacy. So whether the vaccine is working, but you know, early in, the, in testing, so in phase one of testing, we're primarily interested in safety. As we move farther and farther along, we get more and more interested in the efficacy part, but safety is still uh, equally important. And then as you move to licensure, then all of the information you collect, all the information the Data and Safety Monitoring Board has reviewed goes to the, um, to the Food and Drug Administration, the Ministry of Food and Drug Safety in Korea or EMA or um, the Brazilian National Regulatory Authority will review the entire packet. And for a standard vaccine trial, in the old days, it used to be 100,000 pieces of paper, and now it's all electronic. Um, but it's still a huge amount of information that the regulatory agencies have to review in order to ensure that vaccines are safe and effective. So although we're, we're collecting a lot of data in a very short time on safety, you know, eight, you know, well, six to 18 months, there will be longer follow-up of people in vaccine trials to make sure that nothing bad is happening to them or to make sure that the um, the vaccine which induces uh, immune responses isn't going to uh, cause a problem you know, two years later or three years later. We're doing the same thing in our collaboration with Butanta. We're helping to collect some of the safety data and put them into databases so that people can, um, can more easily access them and, and, and look at the information that's, that's there.
Well, Dr. Kim, you've said that there are many organizations that do this work for uh, Europe is EMA and for the US is someone else. So is it possible to happen that one place, one country has already uh, given the response and allowed a vaccine to move on while some other places are still being cautious about what could possibly happen? And do you believe that maybe because of the now happening corona outbreak and uh, this could possibly lead to everybody releasing other vaccines from other diseases i don't know maybe releasing other vaccines for other diseases um do you mean not not looking at them or do you mean um not testing them i i, uh, I ask in the way that maybe because of the coronavirus, everybody will now give more focus to vaccines and understand more the import importance that they have. And because of that, some other vaccines uh, may come now faster because everybody is going to pay more attention to medicine and vaccines. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So the, the first part of the question, which I think is um, what happens in some uh, countries approve it and some countries don't. So I think with, with COVID-19 in particular, there's going to be a huge push to make sure that as many countries around the world will recognize the, and be able to evaluate the, the data packet to ensure um, that people all over the world uh, will have access to the vaccine through the, the national governments. And how does that happen? So for typically a vaccine, um, say one made in Europe, um, the European EMA will review the, all the safety and um, efficacy, the, the data that the vaccine works, and will say, okay, we agree. Um, the, the vaccine protects 80% and is safe. No significant uh, adverse events or serious adverse events. <clears throat> Once the company has that, then there's a second process which goes through the World Health Organization. And the World Health Organization actually independently looks at the company and you know, make sure that the company can, is doing things at high quality. It looks at all the data on safety and efficacy. And if it passes the, F, the WHO, the World Health Organization's um, requirement, then it is what we call pre-qualified. Pre-qualification is actually really important for companies around the world um, <clears throat> because it allows their vaccine to be purchased by United Nations agencies. So for instance, UNICEF, could purchase a huge amount of vaccine and provide it to Gavi, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization. Gavi has a stockpile or maintains these virtual stockpiles and allows vaccine to be shipped to different countries, even countries that can't afford it. So the WHO pre-qualification gives many countries um, which don't have an FDA or an EMA equivalent uh, an opportunity to, you know, to say, okay, we all agree. This vaccine is made well. It does what the company says it does. The, you know, the, the EMA agrees, the WHO agrees, um, we all agree that this is a, a well-made vaccine. Um, it should be adopted. And then there's a second group at WHO called the SAGE, Strategic Advisory Group of Experts in Immunization. And the SAGE actually will look at the data and say, we agree, everyone in this world should get this vaccine or everyone under the age of 80 should get this vaccine. They'll, they'll make a, a recommendation for use of the vaccine. And this is helpful because not every country in the world is like Brazil. Brazil has a, um, a national body that recommends uh, vaccine use, and it's composed of experts in vaccination. And Brazil, you know, being a developed economy, has those capabilities. But if you were in a, a smaller African country and you don't have, you know, enough experts to advise the government, then the World Health Organization's recommendation is really critical uh, for that. So, yeah, and so we go through this process. But then there's another step. Um, I would guess that because of the nature of this emergency that we will try to expedite all of the, the elements that will get this vaccine approved by um, WHO and you know, countries around the world and then recommended for use. The bigger problem may actually be, you know, can we make enough? And can we distribute it fairly? Because those are gonna be the big questions. I mean, I, I think there's, 
I think that we'll probably be able to have a vaccine um, within the six to 18 months. I mean, it's, it's kind of a big assumption, but the first generation of vaccines are you know, moving along pretty nicely. We can show protection in uh, monkeys um, and you know, monkeys are um, as close as we're going to get to being able to test something before we actually test it in humans. Um, so we're hopeful uh, that we'll make progress. We know that there are safety mechanisms and reviews in place. And we just have to make sure that when we have a vaccine, that it's made in sufficient quantity and quality and that it's distributed around the world uh, equitably. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Kim. So now we're moving on to a question from Maria Eduarda Gonçalves. She's gonna come up an audio and talk to us. Maria, I'm gonna allow you to speak right now. Maria, can you, are you listening to, uh, listening to us? Uh, okay, can you listen to me? Yes. <laughs> All right, so uh, do people that get COVID-19 become immune to it for good? Or is there a chance, in, ca in this case, is there any evidence that it mutates as quickly as flu? So like one cannot build a lasting immunity against it. That is my question. That is a great question. And there was just recently a paper uh, from a, a colleague of mine um, at Los Alamos Laboratory in New Mexico that, that argued that um, one of the mutations in particular, so let's see, back up a little bit. Um, if you look at the genome of COVID-19, it's got about 30,000 base pairs. That is 30,000 pieces of RNA, um, one attached to the other. Um, and, you know, it doesn't, it, there haven't been a lot of mutations. In fact, um, eight to tenfold fewer than you would see in, in a standard flu uh, virus that's mutating or, you know, infecting people around the world. So it appears to mutate uh, less quickly, uh, less rapidly than uh, flu on the one hand. On the other hand, what they noticed was that in Europe, a new strain appeared um, as a result of a single change in, a, in one of the um, sequences. And that new strain appeared to be the dominant strain taking over the infections in Europe. So it became now the, it went from you know, nothing to 100% of the um, sequenced viruses uh, in a very short period of time. And so that raised the question, well, is this a new uh, type of virus? Um, Will the vaccines that were developed with the original virus um, protect against the new strain? Uh, and we don't know. Um, so laboratories around the world, including uh, the groups that, that were involved in the sequencing uh, project that was reported last week, um, are trying to find out if uh, the, the vaccines will generate um, what we call neutralizing antibody that will cross neutralize this new strain. And so we don't have the answer to that yet, but I expect that we will. Other experts were saying, well, we can't overplay this because again, you know, we're looking at a relatively small number of mutations compared to say HIV or even compared to, to the influenza virus. So we're hoping that you know, viruses mutate themselves all the time. The more important thing for a human is you know, the protective responses. And, and often our protective responses, these um, infection fighting proteins called antibodies, will tolerate a small amount of variability in the thing that it binds to and neutralizes. So we're hoping that there's um, cross protection broadly against uh, COVID-19, but we haven't proven it yet. Uh, and that's something that you know, several labs around the world, including ours, are trying to determine uh, now. Well, thank you very much, Eduarda, for your question. Now we would like to open Giovanna Smabruga and microphone for her to ask a question. Giovanna, is that okay? Giovanna, I guess we can't hear you yet. One question, yeah. try again. Um, hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Um, okay, so I can 
And my question is, in government and private investors research in the medical field, especially in regards to vaccines? Yeah, I think we, we it cut. Breno, can you read the, the question? Because I think uh, uh, the, the quality was not good enough. Yes, Reynaldo, I will read it. So Giovanna was asking us, in which way do you think, Mr. Kim, the current pandemic will change the stance of government and private investors towards research in the medical field, especially related to vaccines for future coronavirus? So that's interesting. Um, the you know governments had um, uh, programs to look at uh, outbreak diseases and you know the interest in these things te seems to come and go depending on the on the outbreak of the of the year. Um, there was a lot of, of interest generated in strengthening global uh, health security after the Ebola outbreak in uh, 2014 2015, and and that was appropriate and and um, and good. But attention began to wane. Uh, after that. Uh, and so a lot of the, the programs were uh, not a high priority for funding because, again, you're dealing with something that could come tomorrow, could come a, a year from now, or might not come for like COVID-19 for 100 years since the Spanish flu outbreak. So, you know, how do you sustain the interest of government? Like many things in government, they're, they're making, um, they're placing essentially a bet that their investments are going to amount to something over time and you know protect their people, uh, but it's harder to see for outbreaks than it is to say, for instance, investing in a university because you know the university will be used. You know, um, kids, young adults will go there. They'll become educated. They'll contribute to society. The the benefit is clear. For what we're doing for outbreaks, um, it's it's less less clear. The benefit is um, is not necessarily seen. And if we manage to avert an outbreak, it prevent it or, or or stop it from happening altogether, and no one sees it. Um, it's hard to tell a government, well, we did this, and they'll say, well, show us, and we'll say, well, it's not there. Um, so I hope that, like the Ebola outbreak, that this will result in, in much more sustained interest uh, in, in the different kinds of outbreaks and in vaccines for outbreaks. You know, there is an organization called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, uh, and it is a a group of countries and uh, philanthropies, so like the Gates Foundation and the Wellcome Trust, but also you know the government of Norway, the government of Japan, the government of India, um, the government of Germany and and United Kingdom, um, not the United States or China. And CEPI's job is to develop vaccines for outbreaks, and it arose out of the Ebola outbreak, where you know it looked like we were going to have this disease that was killing you know, tens of thousands of people but we didn't have a vaccine, even though we had known about this horrible virus for since the 1970s. And you know, a number of laboratories had vaccines sitting in their freezers, but they'd never been tested in humans. And you know, here we were in the middle of this outbreak and everyone thought, well, get the companies to do this. So companies, you know, President Obama called a number of the major companies and they dropped the work that they were doing and they started working on Ebola and then won't you, wouldn't you know exactly what you predict happened, the epidemic started to die down. And luckily one company, Merck, was able to test its vaccine and show that the vaccine worked in a single trial. And you know, it just, the other companies didn't make it. And so they spent you know, hundreds of millions of dollars working on vaccines that were never able to be tested. And if you're a company, you're gonna think, well, do I really wanna do that again? So they created CEPI and CEPI's goal was to make sure that, you know, we start working on a vaccine. We will take it to the point where we will either have a stockpile of it so we can rapidly test it uh, in the case of another outbreak, or um, we will rapidly fund organizations get it, put vaccines out there more quickly uh, than we saw during the Ebola outbreak. So when they announced uh, COVID-19 in January, when the Chinese government published sequences and, and made announcements and um, reported on it, um, CEPI immediately reached out to companies that they knew could make vaccines quickly. And this was really important. And they provided funding 
to do uh, to get from you know the start from the laboratory all the way in into the clinic in four months. And so far, um, two of the companies have made it into clinic, um, Moderna and Inovio. Um, and so those vaccines are entering phase two testing now, uh, which is really important. And you know, CEPI is to be congratulated because they pulled together those resources, they got people organized, they reviewed all the scientific proposals, they picked companies and they continue to add to companies. So um, the vaccine from Oxford is also funded in part by CEPI. And this is important because when CEPI does something, it, it makes a company sign the Global Access Agreement, which gives the opportunity for that vaccine to be manufactured in large quantity uh, all over the world and provided to people at a reasonable cost, uh, which is really going to be critical if we're going to overcome uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So it so seems that when we... So, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. So the second part of the question had to do with investments. And, you know, um, I'm, not a, I'm not a finance person, um, but interest and investment tends to come and go um, like government interest. Um, so I'm not sure if this will create a stronger uh, drive for investments in biotech, for instance, or in, um, in biologically relevant uh, medication or screening for new uh, drugs against uh, viruses. But if it's gotten more countries interested in CEPI and the ideas and ideals that CEPI represents, then it's been a good thing because it's encouraged us all to consider these pandemic threats to the entire world uh, as a threat that we should deal with collectively rather than individually. Very well. So I, I think that in the heart of what you're saying is that when we join efforts, really some real progress can be made, right? Um, and so um, just um, jumping to another question we have from Eitor Silva. Uh, he asks uh, a more, I, I guess at the bottom of it is to what level can we really uh, trust our isolation methods to work? Because his question is directly to if we can, for example, be contaminated uh, by drinking tap water, right? Is the chlorine that we put into water that is designed to uh, prevent us from getting cholera enough to kill the SARS-2? Uh, is it not? Perhaps th there are, are there many um, other ways to get infected that we are just finding out right now that we didn't know in the, f in, in the first place? Um, so th there is an interesting uh, thing here. Um, the SARS-2 virus has an envelope and, it, and it, it's a, a fatty envelope that surrounds the virus. And it makes it uh, sens sensitive uh, to drying out um, because it's derived, you know, it's a, um, similar to the, the outer lining of our cells, uh, the cells that we have in our body. And the virus actually pulls a piece of it away as, as it's escaping from an infected cell. Um, this makes it a little more susceptible to, you know, things like, um, like being in water um, or to soaps, the action of soaps. And, and many of the systems that, that large cities use um, actually are not only chlorine, but actually have a second um, mechanism for inactivation. And I don't know what, what's used in Brazil. It, it doesn't look like there's been transmission um, in water. It does look like you can use uh, monitoring of sewage uh, to tell about the size of outbreaks. So it turns out that in Amsterdam um, in January, they, when they look back at samples that were stored from the sewage system in Amsterdam, they found COVID-19 in January. Um, and that would suggest that the virus was circulating in the Netherlands at the time. Uh, other countries and other, uh, including the United States, have found that monitoring um, sewage is a way that you can actually detect um, the size uh, and nature of, of COVID-19 outbreaks. The problem is um, you can actually find it in, in stool, in, in human excrement, in, in pretty high quantities. It's not clear that it's contagious when it's there. In fact, you know, in Korea, they had some cases of, um, well, initially they were called reinfection. So these were people who had been infected, who had had two negative throat um, swabs, actually it's throat, nose, um, and, and a cough. Those were two negative in a row, uh, a day apart. And then they were positive again a week later. And it turns out that um, the tests that we use to make the diagnosis called a PCR test, is so sensitive, it can pick up you know, small fragments of the virus. It doesn't pick up the whole infectious virus. 
um, but fragments of it. And you can detect fragments for an extended period of time, both in cough and in, in stool. So we don't know, uh, we haven't seen any evidence that it is um, transmissible through water or in sewage, in sewage effluent. Um, but it's, and people have actually looked uh, to see if the virus is infectious and, you know, they haven't been able to grow it. Um, so again, you know, is it infectious? We don't know, but possibly not. Um, do we know for sure? No. Um, but again, you know, if it were transmitted like cholera or typhoid, um, we would probably see it um, expressing itself in a different way than, than the current level of um, uh, aerosol or air, uh, droplet driven transmission. Uh, Dr. Kim, moving on to another. Sorry. Ne um, okay. Uh, we're moving on to a next question. This one's from Gabriel Negrão de Moraes. And he's asking if taking into account that some viruses come very fast and go away very fast, uh, scientists could possibly not have enough time to make a vaccine for that specific virus. And if, because it goes away and comes back without us knowing, and if it's possible by any chance that SARS-1 could come back, mutate it, and start another, another pandemic like that in 2002? So that is a great question, because that's the reason that CEPI exists. Um, the idea would be, and, and the initial, so when Sepi was first formed in 2015, Ebola had kind of gone away. And uh, we've, it's come back in the Democratic Republic of Congo and it's now been suppressed again. Um, but the goal was uh, for three diseases, uh, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, uh, a virus called Nipah, which is primarily in South and Southeast Asia, uh, and then another virus called Lassa fever, which is in West Africa. The idea was that these tend to be episodic. They occur in large outbreaks. And the goal of CEPI was not necessarily to prove right away that the vaccines worked to prevent infection and disease, um, but to create, to take the vaccines through the different phases of development. So remember, phase one in humans is safety. That's about 50 people or less usually. Uh, phase two is immunogenicity and safety. So is the vaccine making the right protective responses, infection fighting protein and killer T cells in the population that we're going to test it in. And then the third phase looks at safety and efficacy. Is the vaccine actually protecting against uh, the disease of interest? And so with CEPI, they were, you know, because these diseases are not that common in the current outbreaks, they were going to test it in phase one for safety, in phase two for immunogenicity and safety. So again, are the right responses being made? And then they were gonna create stockpiles. And the stockpiles and, and um, the investigative uh, protocols necessary to do um, a vaccination to prove that the vaccine works would be used if the disease occurred again. And you know, so during a major loss of fever outbreak, they would take the stockpile and rapidly use it to vaccinate people to prove that the vaccine worked. Um, so that was the mechanism that CEPI had. With COVID-19, it'll probably be around, so we'll be able to test the, the, these new vaccines um, to show that they, to prove that they actually protect against infection and disease. For the other diseases, you're right, we, we need to create the stockpiles. Could SARS-1 come back? It's always possible. I mean, SARS-1 and SARS-2 are close enough. Um, you know, they're 80% similar. So, you know, will there be cross-protection? We don't know. Um, will the same problems that we saw when we tested SARS-1 initially um, happen again in humans. Again, we don't know. The, the one trial that they did in humans of a SARS-1 vaccine, you know, was a, um, was a success. It looked like it worked. We don't know that it protected, but it actually was safe. Um, but again, we won't know for sure um, unless we actually do a, a trial during an outbreak. Um, but I think that, that the question is a good one. You know, when do we decide to make a stockpile? Um, at this point, it looks like SARS-1 is gone. The, the route of transmission, this, you know, it went from bats to um, civets, which are um, a rodent-like animal, I guess, uh, and then to humans, that market has been closed. So, you know, palm civets shouldn't be a, a source of SARS-1 infection. Could they come from someone else, so somewhere else? Possibly. 
the thing about the coronaviruses is that they can live in different species of animal. I mean, that's how they go from bats to um, spiny anteaters maybe, uh, and then to humans, uh, or from bats to camels to humans. So this, we say it's, they're promiscuous. They can use more than one host. And that these, this promiscuity may be very important in terms of how it's transmitted. Understood. So Dr. Kim, we have a question from both uh, Giovanna and Natalia. Um, and they would like to know is, given all this technology that we have right now, and all, uh, I wouldn't say all, but certainly a lot more than we've seen in the past of the efforts of d dozens and countless countries in the world, why is it, um, what are the, uh, the biggest opt obstacles for coming up with a vaccine? Where do you find it the most resistance or um, where are the m most difficult steps to? Uh, to elaborate it? Uh, good question. So um, there, are, there are multiple um, steps along the way where uh, vaccine work gets impeded. Now, um, under normal circumstances, right, the, the five to 10 year, the normal time frame of vaccine development, there appear to be two major, um, we call them valleys of death. The first is from the laboratory into the clinic. So getting something that looks like a great idea from a professor's lab or from a biotech lab, uh, actually through all the animal testing, uh, through the regulatory agencies like the FDA or EMA, and then into the first in human trial. So that's the first valley of death. Actually in, in tech in general, uh, that's often the case, right? So a brilliant scientist comes up with a great idea for a new way to make very, very, very fast computers. And you know he or she, has that idea in their laboratory, they may be able to do you know, something that looks like a, a giant construction, but it's never gonna be practical. Getting it then into, you know, into the most important parts of the design phase are a big gap. And it's like that for vaccines too. And to get over that gap, you need funding. And you know, typically it's, it's a lot of funding. It's you know, millions of dollars to get from the laboratory, have the vaccine made in a way that is high enough quality to allow it to go into humans. Because the quality of something that goes into humans has to be uh, up to an international standard. Um, once it's in humans and we can take it through phase one and assuming then, you know, now phase two is even more expensive because there's more people and more testing that has to be done. And then phase three sometimes is tens of thousands of people. I did a phase three study that was 16,402 people. Uh, one of my colleagues did one that was 40,000. And so you can see as the size of the trials goes up, the complexity goes up, the cost goes up. And so you'll need funding along the way. But usually once you get it into humans, most people are interested in taking it through, you know, whether, whether it works or not. And then you have the next big step. Just because you've shown that the vaccine works, well, people use it. And there are vaccines that, you know, really didn't get over the second, we call it valley of death. Um, the, we call it the implementation gap. So just because you have a vaccine that works, say a vaccine against malaria, doesn't mean that com countries around the world are immediately going to take it up. It needs uh, to be pre-qualified. That is approved by WHO for purchase by you know, different organizations. It needs a recommendation from the World Health Organization that countries around the world should use it. Um, and it needs to be manufactured in sufficient quantity, provided to organizations that will distribute it and, and countries that will use it. So you have to convince a Ministry of Health. You know, you would save a lot of money if you vaccinated, use this vaccine to prevent malaria in you know, children in your, um, in your country. And then the Ministry of Health has to convince somebody else because typically the Ministry of Health doesn't write checks. It's the Ministry of Finance. So they have to go and argue with the Ministry of Finance, well, you know, we need $40 million to buy the vaccine and, and use it uh, using our healthcare workers to do the vaccination campaigns that will prevent you know, 100,000 children from, from dying from malaria. And that process takes time. And so implementation step uh, can sometimes be a, a problem. It's less of a problem if you're a big company. So when Pfizer or Merck comes up with a vaccine against pneumonia, and it, they show that it you know, is 80% effective and it protects not only the children, but their grandparents. Um, you know, the United States Food and Drug Administration says, yeah, it works. The group in the United States that recommends vaccines say, says, yes, we should use it in children. Oh, and we should use it in people over 65, uh, regardless of whether or not they've gotten another vaccine, it should be used. 
and then the company can sell it. Um, that doesn't always happen with global health vaccines, unfortunately. And hopefully with COVID, we'll be able to coordinate the, uh, the process of approval and uptake to get over those gaps. But now we're talking about a lot of money, right? So if you were a big company like Pfizer or Merck or GSK, um, you're thinking that it will cost you between 500 million and $1.5 billion to develop this vaccine. That's a lot of money. Even for a big company, it's a lot of money. And, and it's time that you know thousands of people in the company are gonna be working on this. They're gonna set up new manufacturing facilities. Uh, and so when a company's thinking about this, they're making, um, they're making a bet. They're making an investment on uh, something that will generate uh, profit for them in the future. Well, how do we do that for a global health vaccine? because this is a vaccine that you can't sell for a hundred or $200 a dose in the United States or Europe. This is a vaccine that has to be provided at low cost or no cost to a lot of countries around the world. Um, and how are you going to justify the expense um, of doing that? So, you know, I, I really respect the innovation that the big companies bring. Uh, CEPI has managed to engage some of them and has engaged a lot of small companies. And small companies are great, but when you need 100 million doses of vaccine, you're gonna need someone who, who, that manufactures vaccines for a living. And so those are the big companies. Uh, and so again, uh, we're working through this, but if the three things in vaccines are prove that it works, make it in high quantity and quality, and then use it, we're, we still have to work on the, 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 two, the two things at the end, um, making it and using it. Well, Mr. Kim, to wrap up, we have one last question from Yumi Liz, who's asking if you believe that the pandemic will by any way reduce anti-science movements like the anti-vaccine movement after all this current time is over. You know, um, so I don't understand the anti-vaccine movement. Uh, as well as I should. There's some evidence, at least from the UK, the United Kingdom, um, that the anti-vaxxer movement is softening. Um, that if we had a COVID vaccine, that more people would take it on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, a quarter of the people in France, when polled, say that they wouldn't necessarily take a vaccine if there was one for COVID. Um, and again, I think a part of this is, you know, it's an unknown. And you know, people are a little fearful of the unknown. Once you know, governments and, and others recognize that we have a vaccine that is safe and effective, and say it's you know, 80% effective in preventing disease, then it's going to be harder for people to, to say, well, no, I don't want it. Um, once we have a vaccine in hand, when we're speaking theoretically and hypothetically, and you know, what if companies say, well, if you don't take the vaccine, then we're not gonna employ you, or if, Insurance companies say, well, if you're not going to take the vaccine, then we're going to have to charge you more, or we may make you pay for your hospital stay. Um, you know, those are kinds of things that we just can't anticipate at this point. And I would hope that this proves that science, when it's well done and well conducted uh, and done even under tremendous pressure of a pandemic like COVID-19, um, is able to overcome technical issues and still provide a product that works and is safe. Um, but we won't know until we actually have it. And, um, and then we'll see. You know, it's interesting though, that you know, a president who at first was not terribly interested in vaccines um, asked, when are we gonna have the vaccine? So when are we gonna have it? And has been saying, you know, we're gonna have a vaccine by the end of the year. That makes a difference. And um, you know, Science is, is a great thing. And, um, you know, it's unfortunate that it's been, you know, that, that politics has, has wrapped itself around um, what should be a process that we should be able to conduct um, with appropriate supervision. And, um, but, you know, in the light of day and show that a vaccine works and is safe and then see it through to its logical conclusion. Because remember that vaccines don't save lives, vaccination saves lives. So we have to accomplish the mission of convincing people, not only the vaccine is safe and effective, but then in protecting themselves, they protect their families, their neighbors, the people at church, the people who go to the theater with them. 
you know, in order to have, to get back to what we would call the old normal, um, we'll need a vaccine. Um, Dr. Kim, uh, so this is uh, Reynaldo. I just uh, want to thank you so much for your time. So we are already at uh, 9 a.m. Uh, so time. Uh, it's a lovely conversation. I think Enzo just dropped, uh, I'm sorry, uh, internet connection in Brazil. <laughs> and uh, do you have any final uh, considerations that you want to share with the students about uh, COVID-19 or quarantine or anything that you would like, final message? Yeah, I think I think it's important to remember that you know it's it's really hard, and flattening the curve is really just a temporary solution. Um, that in the end, you know, countries will have to move on. Um, we have to remember that uh, to provide services and support uh, for everyone in the population during the time of COVID, and this applies now as countries, people working together with unified leadership, with unified messaging. Uh, and, and moving together to ensure that, that during the, the worst of the pandemic, that services and support to people who need it is still provided. And that as, um, as countries, we also need to work together. You know, this is a, an opportunity for the world to get together, for countries to unify around, you know, public health measures that are going to prevent unnecessary disease and death. And, you know, the sooner that we can do this, uh, the more effective we'll be. It doesn't help when we, you know, are attacking each other. Um, so we really need to, to work together in order to overcome uh, COVID-19. Okay, so thank you so much, Dr. Kim. I think Enzo is back. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, next week we'll have uh, another webinar with uh, Dr. Robson from Stanford talking about the future of medicine. And uh, once again, Dr. Kim, thank you so much for your time. Uh, for the great answers, very thorough answers, and uh, I hope you helped a lot of people to understand more about the, the, the epidemic that we're facing right now. Thank you. It was a pleasure to speak to you all. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, see you next week on Saturday, 2 p.m. Brazil okay. time. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Appreciate your time once right. again. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. And just to wrap up, I don't know if I should be saying this, but you have a really beautiful voice. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Brenda. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.